So in this video I'm going to be talking about the standard model and the forces and particles that make up part of the standard model. So first of all, what is the standard model? So it's the collection of theories which explain what's going on in the universe, so explain the various phenomena that you can observe and test and that kind of thing. But once you start looking at the early universe and black holes, actually you find the standard model has issues explaining things and actually it doesn't predict what you'd expect or what we can see. And that's why you might have heard of some of these other theories. So we're talking about supersymmetry or string theory. Those of you who uh, watch the Big Bang Theory might have heard of those. They're, they come up quite a lot in the show. But this is all getting very complicated. Let's try and break it down into some of the fundamentals of the standard model. So it's based on four types of interaction. So we've got the strong nuclear interaction, the electromagnetic, or sometimes known as electrostatic, the weak interaction, and the gravitational interaction. And this list is in this order because we essentially you've got increasing strength. going this way. So as you go up the list you find stronger forces. So the strong force is the strongest shock horror and the thing that catches people out is the weak force isn't actually the weakest. Gravitation, gravitational interaction or gravity is by far and away the weakest force which is why it's the force that we as scientists know the least about which is often surprises a lot of people. So let's talk about the strong nuclear force first of all. So there's some key characteristics you need to know about for it. First, it occurs between any particles that are made of quarks, and we'll talk about what those particles are a bit later in the video. Now, for um, separation distances less than 0.5 femtometers, where a femtometer is 10 to the minus 15 meters, it's repulsive, which means by convention we give it a positive sign, which means by convention we give attractive forces a negative sign. So let's put this, you've got this as your negative zone, this is your positive zone. So the strong force is repulsive here. So you have this section of the strong force graph that looks like this. And we've got this key crossover, which is 0.5 femtometers. Then what happens is it becomes attractive, so it becomes negative, and it goes up to a peak and this peak is about two femtometers. And then what happens is you get this point here. So let's mark on some of these key things. So this is about two femtometers. And this mark here where it stops happening, it's called the range, is about three to four femtometers. So actually beyond that, the strong force has no impact, it's not an infinite range force, it cuts off at 3 to 4, and that's why we say it has a range of 3 to 4, because that means it cuts off at 3 to 4. So this is the general shape of the strong nuclear force graph, and this is something you need to know about. So let's move on to the electromagnetic force. So it can be both attractive and repulsive, and it occurs between any charged particles, so like protons, electrons, all of those charged particles, and it's an infinite range force. So because it can be both attractive and repulsive, you'll see it both above and below the x-axis, because depending on whether it's attractive or repulsive, but it has the same magnitude throughout here. And infinite range means it never stops, so an electron on Earth has a force on an electron on the other side of the universe. It's truly an infinite range force. So, that's electromagnetic. Um, the weak force is something that's not gone into too much detail on the AQA specification, but um, there's a few things you do need to know. So it acts between anything that's a fermion, and we'll look at what a, those are, um, but um, baryons, which are made of three quarks, uh, can interact through the, with the weak force, and leptons, which are made of no quarks, can interact through it as well, but what can't are mesons, which have a quark, an antiquark, or two quarks, but we'll go into those in more detail later on, but the weak force can only act between these certain ones. And it has a range of about 10 to the minus 17, 10 to the minus 18 metres. 10 to the minus 18 is an atometer, for those of you interested. 
But the key thing about weak force in the AQA specification is actually it causes decay. So it causes particles to change from one into another. So like protons to turn into neutrons, muons to turn into electrons, that kind of thing. But I'll explore that in a later video in more detail. The last of the set, gravitational force, can only be attractive. So if we think attractive was negative, so we've got a graph that looks like this. And remember, this is the weakest of the forces, but it is infinite range. So again, um, and it's something across the universe is having a force on us. It's just very small, so we can't feel it. Um, but it can occur between anything that has mass. Those of you who've been reading about the Higgs boson will actually know about how mass is caused by the interaction of a Higgs field. Well, that's the current theory anyway. But again, too much detail for this. Let's carry on and stick to the fundamentals. Okay, so those are the four types of forces. And now we need to know about the particles of the standard model. So here we've got this category with all of the particles in it. The first division that's made is separating them into hadrons and leptons. Now, hadrons comes from the Greek word hadros, which means big, or, yeah, like very big. So it tends to have all of the bigger particles in it, whereas leptons tend to be smaller. But the actual way they're classified is using the strong nuclear force. So hadrons can interact through the strong nuclear force, whereas leptons are defined as particles that cannot. Now, a common mistake people make is... Uh, people say that hadrons can interact through the strong, leptons through the weak. That's not how they're classified. It's only talking about the strong force and whether they can interact through it or not. And the reason for that is some hadrons can interact through the weak force as well. So, as I said before, we've got this word hadrons from some ancient Greek, which scientists seem to love using Greek letters and stuff, so carrying on. And the hadrons can be further subdivided into two categories. You've got your baryons and you've got your mesons. So baryons are made of three quarks or antiquarks, and mesons are made of exactly one quark and one antiquark. Another common mistake people have is that they say a meson is made of two quarks. It's not. It's made of a quark and an antiquark, so watch out for that one. So let's... We've been yammering on about quarks, so let's actually go into those in a little bit more detail and explain what they are. So all hadrons are made from quarks. It's what allows them to th work through the strong nuclear interaction. But there are actually six different types. So there is, they're separated into top types and bottom types. So top types are up, strained, and top, and bottom types are down, charm, and bottom type here. But in the AQA specification, the only ones we're going to come across are up, down, and strange. So anything of these ones we're not going to encounter as part of the course. But if you are interested to looking at, in looking at those in more detail, a physics website called Hyperphysics goes into that and explains how we actually know quarks exist. So if you're interested, do go look at that. But that's quarks. So going back to what I was talking about before, looking at uh, the baryons and the mesons, talking about baryons. So you'll have come across some baryons before. Protons are a type of baryon, and neutrons are a type of baryon. And so we need to think about actually how are they constructed from quarks. So a proton is made up of two up quarks and a down quark, and a neutron is made from one up quark and two down quarks. And I'm going to show you how we found that out and how you can deduce that in the next slide. Key thing to remember is antiparticles are made of the opposite quark. So if it's made from two up quarks and a down quark, an anti one will be made from two anti up quarks and one anti down quark. So it's exactly the opposite of it. But I'll discuss antimatter in more detail in a later video. I don't want to focus too much on that now. And then there are the other type, mesons, made of a quark and an anti quark. And as usual with this video, they've got two types of those. So, there are pions, which don't contain any kind of strange quark or antiquark at all, and there are kaons, which contain exactly one strange or anti-strange quark. There is a slight revisor to that. In pions, if they contain both a strange and an anti-strange, 
they cancel each other out and it ends up being non-strange. Um, but that's a very specific example there. Um, but those are the general rules which allow you to separate them. Let's work out the quark configuration of different particles. So in your formula sheet, you have this table over here in the AQA specification anyway, and it tells you about the three types of quarks you need to know about. It tells you about their charge in terms of the charge of an electron, so it's two-thirds of the charge of an electron. And it tells you the baryon number, and I'll explain what the significance of that in a later video about conservation laws. And it tells you the strangeness of the quark and whether it has that strangeness property, so only strange quarks do. So, a common exam question is that you're actually asked to deduce the configuration of a particle you haven't seen before. Um, so, let's try and do it for a pi plus meson. So, it's a pi on and it's positively charged with a charge of plus one. So, it must have a quark and an antiquark because it's a meson. The charges of these quarks must add up to give you plus one because it's a pi plus, And the strain just must be zero in order to be a pi on and not a k on. Um, if you're going to get to plus one with two quarks, one of them is going to need to be a plus two-thirds quark. So you're going to have to have this up quark here. And in order to get to one, you're going to need the other quark to have a charge of plus a third. So it must be the anti-quark of either the down or the strange. And since it's not a k-on, it's a pion, it can't be this strange one, which leaves you having an anti-down, which has the opposite charge of this, so it would be plus one third. So that's how you can do a quark configuration and how you work out what they are and they're very common questions in exams. Now the other types of particles we haven't looked at much are the leptons. So they're the particles which can't interact through the strong interaction. So there are three types of these, so unlike the two which we've been dealing with so far in this video, we've got three. So you can have tau types, you can have muon types, and you can have electron types, which you might have met before. So these tau are the most massive ones, the muons are the, in the middle, and the electrons are the smallest type. So in terms of the mass of leptons, it goes tau particle, muon particle, electron particle, tau neutrino, muon neutrino, electron neutrino in decreasing mass or energy once we look at that. And the other key thing is the neutrinos, the clues in the name, are neutrally charged, whereas the particles have a charge of minus one, so they're like an electron, but towers are just heavier electrons and muons are heavier electrons also. Um, so those are your leptons, and these are all types of, they're called fundamental particles, which means you're not, you can't make them from anything. So this is a, a class, specific classification of particles, so if in the current model we don't think they can be broken down into anything smaller, then we class them as a fundamental particle. So hadrons and baryons and mesons are not, because they're made of quarks, so they can be broken down. Whereas leptons and neutrinos and quarks are fundamental, because they can't be broken down. So here we've got some examples of the different types of fundamental and non-fundamental particles, and it's just another way of classifying stuff.